This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic Topic is... The island nation of Nauru. An island whose history I stumbled upon on YouTube, found interesting, learned a lot about it, and now I bring this information I learned to you, Nate, and the listener. Nate, what do you know about the island nation of Nauru? I know it's depressing as hell. Yep, that's kind of the history of it, too. But there's some other cool stuff, too, and you get to learn about politics and international trade and all sorts of fun things. So, yeah, the video I sent you always kind of scraped the surface on it. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more about it today. And it'll be fun, no. I promise. <laughs> no! <laughs> ha, you will learn whether you like to or not. <laughs> Don't depress me. I'm, yeah. I'm feeling happy. A little too ha. bad, motherfucker. <laughs> You finally got up a little, scra scraped up a little bit of serotonin, and I'm about to take it away from you. <laughs> but it's not all depressing. In fact, we'll start out with the beginning of this island's history, which is kind of chill. Some <laughs> five million years ago, give or take a million, tectonic plates shift, volcanoes erupt, and the tiny island of Nauru is born. It's roughly eight square mi miles in size, or 21 kilometers. Uh, the middle 80% of this island is a giant plateau that juts up 233 <laughs> feet into the air above sea level. Or it's roughly uh, 50 feet tall in Scrooge's money bin. So there's another reference for you. Yay, money bin. Yay, money bin. Probably been a convenient place for Scrooge to put his money bin. A lot harder to invade on an island, I would think. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you... Now, or it's a Scrooge McDuck have... comic, they probably just stole the whole island. Anyways. Right, right. <laughs> uh. Eventually, this island becomes lush with vegetation and sea life aplenty on the shores. No land critters living there other than the crabs that would scuttle about, but there were lots and lots of birds. You see, the plateau in the middle is a convenient place for migrating birds to stop and take a rest and eat, and crap, and crap and crap everywhere. One of the greatest places in the world for birds to poop, and they came from all around to do it. This will actually be important later. That's why I bring it up. I hope it's important like, you know, Ace Ventura, Pepeo 2, because, you know, guano was important. That was Actually, yeah, that's that's pretty much where we're going. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I got the tip of you. Thank yeah, you, Ace You Ventura. did. <laughs> you solved, yeah. the, solved the mystery before I knew it was a mystery. Right. Oh, I can just think about him licking that bowl now. <laughs> uh, fast forward 4,997,000 years to approximately 1,000 BC, and the first Micronesians, or possibly Polynesians, discover the island and settle it. And, uh, yeah. You gotta admit, that is some pretty brass balls to uh, just look out there in the ocean and be like, I wonder what's out there. Because the nearest inhabitable island from there is 190 miles away, and that seems like a long ways to go on a boat when you don't know where you're going. And not only make it to that island, but make it back as well. Talk to people and be like, look what I found. Let's head back that way. Because I can barely Did they make go it back? Through. I thought that it was kind of like, like a, a virus, just... Yeah, I, I'm not trying to, you know, that sounds Maybe really they did come back. I don't know. They don't really know how it was founded, but I would assume they found the island, then they, like, headed back and got some more people, because... I don't know, I always just assumed it was smaller boats that are hanging over. But you're right, it could have been a couple dozen people at a time. Well, according to the documentary Moana I watched, you know, they, <laughs> you know, a whole, like, bunch of them would just get together and take off. And oh, then okay. they'd land somewhere, and after a while, you know, like, oh, we're explorers. But, I mean, they, in the movie, they never straight up said, oh, we sent out a party, or, like, we just split off, or the whole island is up and leaves. But that doesn't really make sense, because why would you up and leave? Yeah, I get trying to spread out, you have... Too many people in one area, so you want to spread. I mean, that just makes sense, perfect sense, because the only other way is cannibalism and killing each other. That's just, that's just not going to work after a while. You might do that for the first two islands, but as, as it continues, it's going to get messy. So and People just yes. get tired of the whole cannibalism thing. Ah, right. I ate two of my children today. Ooh, that was a so, I mean, you think over time, in fact, that's, that's how I'm sure humanity spread. Like, okay, we, we call this place. It's too small. Some people left, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so, but I just don't know why they want to, I guess, maintain communication, but I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I underestimate the nautical abilities of our ancestors. Because oh, now absolutely, I'm like, I do too. Because these people yeah. are puttering thousands of miles in boats and stuff, and even like little rowboats and little sailboats, like, wow, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, to, I, I'm thinking back, I'm like, you know, they, they made some pretty awesome voyages using star maps, you know, uh, nautical people you right. know, not necessarily the europeans but everyone who, who set up to do it they usually found out how to do it i guess in my mind when they're finding these islands it's like civilization where you just send out one scout or two and they find the island and come back but you're right it probably you know hey let's send out you know this crew of 20 or 30 and see what they come up with 
And also, if you want some reference on where Nauru is located, it's uh, basically the halfway point between Australia and Hawaii, about 3,000 miles from each of those places. 3,000 miles west of Hawaii and 3,000 miles east of uh, Australia. Australia will become important in this story as well. Hawaii. I was say, if that's the case, if it's smack in the middle, I really could have, their allegiance could have gone either way. Um, yeah. Well, actually, not really, because they were up and running long before Hawaii was a state, because it's kind of easy to forget that Hawaii wasn't a state until, what, 58 or something like that? Very true. Yeah. I, I did yeah. forget that. Yeah, I know. It's kind of, I do the same thing where it's like, well, we became American in 1776, and you just think, like, everything was just like, poof, there we go. But no, there's a lot of time where it's like, hey, what's out there past, you know, the Mississippi? Nothing. Pokes that yeah. up. <laughs> it just literally did drop off at the end of the world. <laughs> It, just as their ancestors foretold. Yep. <laughs> just keep They're on going until we fall off. Yep. And then you just, as you're falling, you look back and be like, huh, it is all on the back of a giant turtle. Just like Discworld. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of love that series. I still, whenever I think of the Edge World, I always think, I don't know what, I don't know what book it was because I listened to most of them through audiobook. But there was one where the civilization wanted to see, the whole point was to see the sex of um, the turtle. If it was oh. male or female. And so they had this whole voyage where they guys shoved a uh, guy over the side and they would have scrolled him down like that. I always think about that. You know, and that they had this whole thing. They also had my favorite little bit in there where the guy who made it, uh, it's the whole cliche where you have this master inventor and he makes something for somebody and they're like, we don't want anybody else to know us to like kill him or whatever. And this poor bastard, he was a uh, blind, crippled, um, like burned all this stuff. And his he's like the only request I have to make this thing is to not be killed because everyone he's made things for of all like one people try to blind him, one people or one people blinded him, one people did this, and, <laughs> and they're like, oh, sorry, we can't do that, and they kill his ass. Huh. All I can think about is that dude being uh sent down to check out the turtle genitalia, and he gets down there, and he's like, wait, I don't know what turtle genitalia look like. Yeah, that was yeah. That's the information you need to know. Yeah, right, and be like, oh, I should have brought down a guide or a book or something. So, back to Nauru. The people that settled there had a pretty chill couple of thousand years there at first. They were fairly isolated, didn't have to worry about much invaders, and were able to cultivate their own languages and beliefs during this time. Twelve tribes formed on the island, which was represented by the twelve-pointed star on their flag. They had plenty of pandanus fruit and coconuts to eat, pineapple and the such. They also practiced aquaculture, which was, uh, they had a freshwater lagoon on the island called Boada Lagoon, and they were actually able to climatize saltwater fish to freshwater fish, and uh, they were able to stock that lagoon with milkfish, which I didn't know you could actually climatize saltwater fish to, uh, freshwater. Apparently you can't do it with all fish, but certain, uh, kinds of fish, yeah, you can. And people a couple thousand years ago could do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, impressive. impressive. Most yeah. impressive. That took some, uh, trial and error, I would imagine. Like a lot of things back then. So, yep, they had a source of fresh water in there in the lagoon. They stocked it with fish. Good food there. And uh, they were also able to hunt the birds, too, on the island. All of them pooping birds. And also, uh, all that bird poop did give them very fertile soil. So they were able to grow whatever crops they wanted that they could. So, good times in paradise, as they say. Now, we fast forward to 1798. And British sea captain John Fern is puttering around Oceania, which, uh, that's the continent that uh, Nauru is on. That whole ocean area over there, Australia in that area, that's called Oceano, okay. apparently. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. No, except the battle. And there you go. Oh, you failed. Oh, I did. No, I was reading ahead. I'm, I'm staying <laughs> on topic. <laughs> Throw things at him. <laughs> oh, God. Why did a tomato just hit me? I'm home all alone. So, John Fern is the first European to find Nauru. And he just putters along in his boat, looks out over the starboard side, or however he did it, said, By Jove, that's a pleasant little island over there. I think I shall name it Pleasant Island. And he just kind of puttered on his way and just like rode down the chart and was like, oh, there you go. <laughs> Look at that island. Well, it's a pleasant place. Let's rape it. Let's... Yeah, ha. Uh, nah, give it another hundred years. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, Fern was commemorated by being put onto a $10 Nauruan coin and a Nauruan postage, postage stamp in 1974 for, this, uh, for his efforts. He's like, he's the first English person to compliment our island. We'll put him on a stamp. Right. This guy passed by once. Look at that. Yep, he said this place looked pleasant. We appreciate that. So, by 1826, the British sailors had become regular traders on the island. Uh, 
And even occasional deserters from the ships or like uh, escaped convicts and stuff would make their way to the shore and live on there as beachcombers and you know, kind of sort of integrate with the groups, but not so much. Not so much, you think. Yeah, well, like, it depends oh, yeah. on the one of them. There's one dude there named William Harris who actually got in pretty good with the uh, tribesmen, and he was kind of used as a diplomat between the British government and the uh, tribes. But some of the other guys just kind of like to just show up and kind of cause trouble and be drunken asses on the beach, I guess. We'll have a little more on them later, too. But also, some of the people were literally just guys who were, like, working as a trader on a boat, and they just showed up on that island, and they're like, dude, I am not getting back on that shitty ship with, like, 20 other dudes. I am just going to stay here. Bye. They'd be like, you know, you're deserting your contract. They're like, you know, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, what are they going to do? You know, I mean, I guess they killed them. (laughs) Yeah, they could. But, I mean, then you're wasting a bullet for something you really don't care that much about. Like, well, bye. I'm sure the people on the island just loved that. Yeah, right. Yeah, because... Lots of good juju ha- being, having done with uh, lots of killings on your island. Oh, yeah. Everyone loves it when they get, you know, oh, yeah, I love it when we get, you know, a slaughtered. Yeah. I love it when our island gets known as the Killing Fields. It used to be called Pleasant Island. Now it's called the Killing Fields. So the islanders traded food and potable waters as well as palm wine in exchange for hard alcohol and firearms from the uh, British traders. Uh, I looked up palm wine. Apparently it's mi- wine made from the sap of palm trees. Apparently, it's kind of an acquired taste, kind of weird yet fruity, and only kind of slightly alcoholic, around like 4% alcohol. But I guess uh, because it don't taste that strong, it's pretty easy to drink too much of it and have it sneak up on you. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's, that, like, wow, that's from that's... the comments I found on like Reddit and other uh, message boards. They're just like, hey, it's not bad once you get used <laughs> to it. Just be careful because it can go down too easy sometimes. Wait a minute. You're just having fun, having a drink. Next thing you know, you're in Zimbabwe. Yep. Man. <laughs> don't know how I got there. Yeah. Don't know how to get wife. back. <laughs> but somehow I appear to be married now. <laughs> and these ADLBs just keep going. <laughs> I think I feel them in my throat. <laughs> I honestly don't know how they got all these up there. But uh, as hor- I am as uh, impressed as I am horrified. Uh, dude with really long, slender arms. <laughs> Anyways, as any good American can tell you, once you get some firearms and some booze in you, it's time to start a civil war. And 1878 starts the 10 year civil war of Nauru. You want to know how it started, Nate? Of course you do. Well, there was a marriage ceremony going on, and the attendees had a discussion about the points of etiquette at a wedding ceremony, what you should and should not do. Well, that discussion became heated thanks to the booze, and, uh, well, since there's firearms now there, there became an argument between the chief and uh, one of the uh, tribe's members, and the chief's son wound up getting shot in the chest and killed out of the deal. Which I, I do thought, believe that is I a guess. Saying, is, hmm? They got heated. They had an argument. They had a fierce debate whether they should go to civil war or not. Huh. <laughs> and then after hours of debating, they decided no at first. It was very civilized. <laughs> they nope. shook hands and realized we shouldn't do this. And so it took umbrage. <laughs> Honestly, if there wasn't a hard booze there, that might have been how it worked out. But, nope. They were talking about the do's and don'ts of a wedding ceremony, and uh, they did one of the don'ts and shot one of the other people and killed them. Well, in the rune culture, it's pretty clear that death must be avenged, uh, you know, by the family. Eye for an eye, that kind of stuff. Which, you know, back in the olden days when you're doing stuff with, like, spears and rocks and slings, it's a little harder to kill somebody. A little bit easier to take your revenge when you have guns and you just basically have to, you know, point and click. So, all of a sudden... Hmm? I was just laughing at the point of play. Oh, yeah. That is guns. It's, you know, point and click yeah. fighting. If you miss, a dog would come up and laugh at you. He was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the horrors of war. Every, t- ah. every single time you miss, he just pop up and laugh. Uh, just... <laughs> many many a men have fallen to the laughter of that fucking dog. Just people having PTSD just rocking in the corner. <laughs> the dog just keeps laughing. Keep laughing. I can't shoot him. Uh... So anyway. basically, this, yeah, this eye for an eye all snowballed into uh, two groups eventually. One loyal to King Awida, 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 mm, something like that. Awida, 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 um, and the rebels who won their own man in charge. This basically became a stalemate with one group in the north and one in the south of the island because they're mostly equally matched, same amount of guns, same amount of weapons, same amount of knowledge of the area. Mm. Basically, you know, the same fighting, the same big stalemate. Also, here's yeah, I, I think it would be pretty mm-hmm. difficult. Yeah, it'd be pretty difficult to again, like everyone, it knows. Yeah, it's a small island. We all yep. know everything. That little hidey hole you have, we all know about it. It's yeah, we've fine. all been that hidey hole. 
That's called that's called the jerking off hole. That's where we go when we need some privacy. But then if you think about it this way as well, once the fighting's all done, you know somebody. Like you kill, right. you killed someone you knew. Like oh, like oh hey, how is that was so and so? Oh yeah, it's nice to a... meet you. I'm pretty sure I killed half your family. Yeah, right. That's gonna be a very awkward uh, you know, holiday season <laughs> next year when you're just like, so guess I gotta buy you left get less gifts this year since I killed your kids. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah. What's all point in that? Ah. Here's a fun fact. Uh, the king of Naru's, uh, King Awaida's dad, was named Chief Jim. J-I-M, like old Jim who works at the machine shop. Not a name you would expect for uh, Narushin. Narushin? Naruin? Right. Uh, there's old Jim over there. Jim Timmy Daru. 1881 rolls around three years into the Civil War, and the British Navy swings by the island to see what's up with they go to that British beachcomber, William Harris, we talked about a minute ago, the guy who's kind of uh, the diplomat. And he reports that the whole island is at war, everybody's drunk, everybody has guns, and it's not good happy times. He also says that the king is kind of talking to people, being like, I really wish some missionaries would show up from other places and kind of like be an intermediary or somebody to kind of you know, be the go-between, because nobody really trusts anybody at this point on the island. The British Navy heard this report, said, huh, neat, and uh, they just left. They didn't care. 1887. Six years later, another British captain out of Australia heads up to Nauru. He stocks up on some coconuts and some palm wine. And he uh, basically reports that all the islanders seem in good spirits. But despite them all, uh, but despite, you know, the war still being on, everybody there is sick and tired of the fighting. They really want it to end, but nobody's willing to put their guns down first because you know what happens when you put your guns down first. You probably get shot. So, again, they're just like, hey, man, could somebody get out here and just kind of, like, be an intermediary and help us hammer out some negotiations? That sure would be nice. Oh, yeah, and the captain also, he ran into that William Harris dude, who, uh, the diplomat guy, and he reports that things on the island are actually kind of sucky, and two of his family members have been shot since the last visit, and he would like help as well. And they're like, don't worry, we'll help you. All we gotta do is take over your entire fucking island. British, actually, it'd be the German Navy who shows up in 1888, and they just plop one of their warships off the coast, and they come on the island, and they're like, all right, here, we're trying to make money in this area, and this seems like it'll be something that'll prevent us from making money in this area, so you guys need to make nice and uh, prepare to be annexed and disarmed, and assimilation is nigh. You're going to be bored to people. So basically, Germany just, they <laughs> gathered up all the tribe members, or the tribe leaders, tribe chiefs, Basically stuck them in a room and explained to them, your guys have, your entire island has one day to give up all your uh, firearms and booze, or we kill you. And the next morning, the natives turned out, turned over 765 weapons and several thousand rounds of ammunition. And, uh, well, hey. yeah, yep, hey, and guns and booze were made illegal on the <laughs> island. The king that was in charge at the time, however, he got to stay, uh, stay in charge of king of the island, kind of sort of in name only, but he was able to make rules and, you know, he did have influence on there. It wasn't like a complete takeover at this point. In exchange... But not huh? a complete takeover, but let's not kid ourselves. If the, if the German said, this is happening, it's not like he's like, no, uh like, Yeah, uh, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, I, I especially really, when the first thing you do is plop a warship yeah, down on the shore. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you may have some power, but the ultimate say is unfortunately not yeah, yours. Yeah, we, we have veto power is what it's called in uh, diplomatic terms. There you go. A veto with a gun. So Germany hoists the flag above it, and all of a sudden, boom, Nauru is now part of the Marshall Islands. <laughs> and uh, they also deposit some Christian missionaries there to help keep things in line. This ends the bloodiest tribal war in Nauru history. Yeah, absolutely. We fast forward to 1899, and we skip over to New Zealand for a moment. We're in the office buildings of the Pacific Island Company, where a 30-year-old man named Albert Fuller Ellis stares at a doorstop that uh, his boss has. It's this large tr chunk of rock, and Albert is like, hey, what's that doorstop there? And his boss is like, that's petrified wood I got out on an island. And Albert stares at some more and goes, can I take that rock for testing? I think that's something else. And the boss is like, sure, go for it. So he takes that rock and gets it tested. Well, it's not petrified wood. In fact, it is super high-quality phosphate. Super high-quality and super valuable phosphate, too. Albert Fuller comes back to the boss. He's like, yo, where'd you get this rock? This thing could be worth a lot of money. And the boss is like, yeah, go over to this island, Nauru. This place is just covered with rocks like that. 
And uh, yeah, remember how we were talking about birds crapping for uh, for millions of years? Turns out yep. petrified bird poo turns into phosphate, among dun, other stuff dun, too. Dun. Like, you know, yeah. And that island is just thick with it. In fact, that giant plateau in the middle of it is basically just all phosphate. What's phosphate used for, you might ask? Uh, mainly the number one use, especially back then, was fertilizers. Good for growing crops. But it can also be used in uh, explosives, stuff like rodent poison and animal feed, and some medicines. Main use, fertilizers, though, for all intents and purposes. So, Albert is on the next ship to Nauru and arrives in 1900 to find his greatest dreams come true. That island is just covered in the highest quality phosphates you could imagine. And I would imagine, you know, little dollar signs that pop up over his pupils, you know, his, like, hat flies off his head for just saying, he's like, Ruga! Pulls a Scrooge McDuck. Kind of Ruga! Ruga! Woo! Look at that! <laughs> So, didn't take long, because by 1906, the Pacific Phosphate Company is all set up, and them and Germany are ready to tag-team that island and get all they can out of it. They import a bunch of Chinese workers, because they're actually seen as harder workers, and they work for cheaper wages than uh, the Nauru's would. And by 1907, the first shipment of Nauru Phosphate is on its way by ship. Boo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see, trouble ahead, huh? Yeah, like I said, I mean, I... I see. Yeah, I watched that video, so I know this is going. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not down. No, sir. I don't like it. Ha. Huh. Well, also, it's kind of of note that uh, they also found basically the exact same thing on Nara's closest neighbor, Banaba, the one that we actually talked about a little earlier. This is you know, 190 miles, I think, away. Right. Well, the downside for Banaba it was these guys were not under German jurisdiction. So when the mining company went over there and saw, hey, this is full of phosphate, boy, they just Scrooge McDucked that chief hard. And they bought the entire island for basically some trinkets, and uh, I guess one of the big selling points they had was canned food. They're like, look at this miracle. Worth so much money. So, yeah, at least with Nauru, the Germans were there, and they're like, uh-uh, we see what you're trying to do. We're going to at least profit off of this and make sure some stuff is going right. Uh, over on Bonaba, nope, that co- uh, corporation, they got just carte blanche to do whatever they want. And uh, you, they, yeah, yeah, whatever they, they want, they did. Y- yeah, Exactly. We'll actually visit that island again in a few moments. Well, in a little bit. So yeah, check in and see how things went with them. <laughs> let, let me guess, not well. Not well, no. As reward for all this, though, Albert Fuller Ellis was knighted by the Queen of England in 1938. As is tradition. Thank you for wiping out some of those other people. Yeah, be knighted for it. <laughs> we love it when you kill... Other people. Other and, people. Those folk. We also like that pause before you put other people in your huh. language. <laughs> <laughs> it only counts that, if you pause. Yeah, and you do that little eyebrow raise. Yes. Other people. Yeah, do a little <laughs> nod kind of, uh-huh. Yeah, no you matter know what we're talking about. No matter what you're talking about, any cut, like, even if you're alone talking to your child, if, uh, <laughs> say, uh, if other people come to a conversation, you must pause other, other people. Other people. <laughs> Uh, and then look around conspiratorially like other <laughs> people dun 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 1914 and World War I starts up and right away Aus- the Australia just zoops right up there to Nauru and kicks the Germans out of it they're like hey we kind of like this island when the war is said and done all over there's a fire sale on German assets as you might know and Australia just raises their hand points in Nauru and they're like oi look what we found can we keep it and uh Yep, the League of Nations was just like, sure, why not? You little cute little scamps, you can have that tiny little island out there. And now Nauru is under Aussie control. As a side note, the early 1900s were kind of rough on Nauru in the form of a sudden influx of outside people caused a massive outbreak of the Spanish flu, tuberculosis, and, and infantile paralysis. That led are, to you a telling me, are you telling me foreigners with rare, weird diseases coming to a small island had bad outcomes? This led to a mortality rate of about 18% of the native people, which was about 230 deaths. So, not a whole lot of people on Nauru at the time. But still, uh, yeah, like 18% of all your people dying, like that's lot. still a lot. That's, yeah, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but again. That's one in five. Enough. So, you know, yeah, look around in that room yeah. of 10 people. Two of you are going to be gone. So, in 1919, the British did a census and realized that the population of Nauru was startlingly low. And they determined that for the Nauru people to survive, they need a population of at least 1,500 people. And they got together with the chiefs and were like, yeah, we need to pump up these rookie numbers. Get to Breen, guys. And it's decided by the chiefs of the island that uh, 
They proclaimed that on the day of the birth that brought their 1500th Naruin, it would be a national holiday called Angam Day, and they would shower gifts upon the child. And uh, so the race was on to have kids and try to get that 1500th baby and get all those free gifts and stuff. Kind of like a sweepstakes in a way. Well. Hey, gotta do something. So you mean seriously? Like, come yeah. on, get the banging. Come on, pandas. Yep, yeah, yeah, basically. Or they just got people like playing the violin just romantically outside of people's places all the time. At all times. <laughs> yeah, around the clock. You're just sitting there pooping, listening to romantic music. Uh, 1921. National Geographic arrives to take a look at the Nauru mines and describes it as, quote unquote, a ghastly tract of land. October 26, 1932. The first Angam baby is born. Her name is Ida Guaro. That's probably wrong, but that's as close as I'm getting. <laughs> Her name expresses the feeling of reaching home or attaining a goal in the Naruan language. The, the name was actually given to her by a combination of the chiefs of the island and the uh, Australian administrator in charge. Named by committee, I guess. That night, large bonfires were lit on the beaches of every district, and the chiefs judged who had the biggest bonfire. And uh, the winners was the Iwo district. And they actually... Uh, Won the best bonfire award by uh, creating blue fire by stoking the fire with copper wire. That's kind of impressive. That's totally impressive. Yeah. Probably looked really cool, too, I'd imagine. Those of you with property, go buy yourself some copper wire and burn it. Let us know how it looks. <laughs> On the 6th and 7th of December, 1940, the German auxiliary cruisers Comet and Orion sank five supply ships in the vicinity of Nauru. Comet then shelled Nauru's phosphate mining areas, or its soil depots, and their equipment. Yes, World War II was now upon us. Bum, bum, bum. A lot of the Nauru people are probably standing around and being like, you know, we could have just been an isolated island. Y'all could have left us alone. That would have been nice about now. Right? Like, y'all yeah. could just kept on going. We were totally yeah. fine. Just, yeah, just thinking back to be like, you know, I could just be swimming with the fish right now. Well, Japan decides that they would like a small phosphate-covered island, and in 1942, they swoop in and take over. Well, things don't really go good for them. First thing they do is they take 1,200 new ruins and ship them off to the Chuck Islands to be uh, slave laborers. Then they bring in a bunch of Chinese slave laborers and put them to work in the phosphate mines, and uh, as well as a bunch of the most of the remaining new ruins were put to work uh, building an airstrip, building fortifications, working in the mines, doing all sorts of forced labor that they did not want to do. Actually, the Nauruan uh, people were basically told, comply or you will be skinned like pigs. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess we know what we're doing. Although, if there was one uh, kind of good thing for the Nauruans, and this is kind of messed up in a good way, but because there was al- because the Japanese brought in Chinese to the island, there was already Chinese laborers there. Mm-hmm. Well, in a Japanese society at the time, you know, Chinese were like the lowest of the low of the low, like lower than dogs or leeches kind of thing. And uh, basically, as long as there were Chinese on the island, they always got treated the worst out of everybody. So the Nauruans were always, you know, not really getting the shit into the stick. I mean, they had it bad, but yeah. the Chinese got it slightly worse. So, yeah. Yay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, you know what I mean. You know how history was. Nauruans were only allowed to have 900 grams of rice and 45 grams of beef per day. That was their daily rations. Chinese got much less. Uh, when the Japanese took over, there was a leper colony with 39 lepers living there that Australia set up. The Japanese said, hey, we're going to take these lepers to our own leper colony off yonder to a different island. Don't worry, it's much nicer there. Loaded all the lepers up onto a boat, took one of their own boats, and towed that boat off to sea, where they promptly let it loose and then sank the boat with their, uh, shot it with, uh, artillery and just sank that boat. Came back to the island and was like, eh, no, that boat sank on its own. Apparently they did not want <laughs> lepers around. It's a tragedy. Yeah, it's a tragedy. No one could have seen this coming other than our <laughs> gunners. Hey, remember those Banabin people? The ones on the non-German controlled island that kind of got shanked we, or shafted we told, talked about just a minute ago? Yes. Well, the Japanese uh, took over that island and basically finished stripping whatever resources that were left there because, uh, yeah, the Australians did, or the British did a real number on that island at this point. And the Japanese basically finished it off and all that was left on that island was Basically nothing, and the Bonobun people were reduced to eating tree bark and grass. Well, instead of uh, killing them all off, the Japanese decided to take all uh, 659 of those starving islanders 
and dropped them off on Nauru. Now, uh, Nauru's population is roughly about 600 right now, or there's about 600 Nauru people on this island, so you gotta imagine all of a sudden having a bunch of emaciated dying people dropped off on your island, numbering about the same as you. There's gotta be some weird trauma based along with that, that goes along with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just picture your neighborhood right now, and all of a sudden it just gets doubled with dying people, and you're like, oh, hmm. Man, I can't pull out. There's a really dead person there. <laughs> Uh, just taking like a push broom, just pushing them out of the way. Also, at Wait. first I thought you meant a different kind of pull out, and I was very confused. Ah. <laughs> yes, <Like>, Jenny, <laughs> dying again. What? <laughs> Why is this guy dying in the room? I gotta get to work. Uh, also, the Japanese did eventually, basically, have a plan of uh, eventually kind of taking all the neurons off the island, and claiming it that way too. Because I guess that was the way they did with all those little Micronesian islands. They just Eventually take all the existing people there and just move them to a different island and be like, well, you got no claim to this because you don't live here anymore. It's ours now, which I guess and which I guess is different than just wiping them out. I'm not sure how, but. I guess. Yeah, no, I just, <laughs> like, I just feel like you're just going to go to that. Things. Just like, yeah, why don't you just like round them up and just execute them? Mm. Thankfully, it did not happen. We love you, Narun people here at Off, off Topic. <laughs> <laughs> So because we are not uh, rooting for your deaths. Yeah, we are really not. We root for you. Because it was heavily fortified and also had this giant coral reef surrounding it, uh, the coral reef made so large boats couldn't get in. Little boats could, but large boats can't. They just get torn up on the reefs. Uh, that island was heavily fortified and hard to invade, so the Allies never did actually take it back during the war. They did try a few times, but uh, never succeeded. In fact, the only way they took it back was because the war ended and Japan surrendered. <laughs> In okay, fact, yeah. even then, even then, it uh, it, it took a little while after the uh, surrender for them to actually give up on that island. It took, it took like five or six days because the Australians had to go through with planes and drop leaflets all over the island, and be like, "Hey, guess what? Surprise! Yep, surprise." So the end result of Nauru was the island was bombed and damaged, the infrastructure kind of destroyed, and of the uh, six hundred Nauruans that were actually left on the island that stayed there, only four hundred lived. Remember those 1,200 that were taken off to uh, forced labor camps? Well, they made their way back, but only 737 of them lived. Among the people who Ooh. died are Angam baby Eidegeng. She died of a case of malnutrition and the yaws while in the labor camp. Oh. Yeah. The yaws, in case you're wondering, is an infectious disease found in tropical climates that leads to ulcers on the skin that eventually leads to bone and joint infections that eventually cause deformities. And, yeah, it's it's it's... Don't Google pictures of it. It's not cool. I'll be sure not to do that. Transmitted by, uh, yeah, it's transmitted by contact with bodily fluids. Non-sexually, too. It's usually spread by kids playing and stuff and horse around. Uh, no vaccine for it, but they can cure it if they catch it uh, soon enough with some penicillin. However, right after World War II, penicillin was in short supply, so they actually were giving people injections of arsenic to cure it, which I guess that helps. Also, injections of arsenic can be used to cure syphilis. Arsenic can? Yeah, arsenic. Who would have guessed? Huh. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's like, like bleach? Yeah. Arsenic <laughs> and bleach? No, just like, you know, back in, you know, oh, COVID. Gotcha. Uh, so, after World War II and everything's wiped out, it's time to try to make another Angam baby. And the Neurons would celebrate their second Angam baby on March 31st, 1949. However, for the actual Angam celebration, they stuck with the original birth from the first time. And that is a holiday that's still actually celebrated on the island. So, war is over and Australia gets right back to Nauru and starts cranking out even more phosphate once they get the mine up and running again. Uh, the UN made a new group of trustees to oversee Nauru. Australia, New Zealand, and the UK are now being uh, the guys in charge of it, with Australia being the main shot callers. 1948. The Chinese laborers on the island would have a financial dispute with the phosphate mining company. Uh, essentially, their work contracts were up, and uh, they are supposed to leave the island, but there's money issues going on, a lot of disputes. And this led to one of the laborers threatening an interpreter and assaulting the messenger. When the police arrived to arrest the guy, the Chinese all barricaded themselves in their compound and readied themselves for a standoff. The island's administrator, Mark Ridgway, declared a state of emergency and dispatched, dispatched an armed riot squad composing of 44 Naroon policemen and 16 European volunteers to the Chinese compound. In the subsequent fight, two of the laborers were shot dead and 16 were wounded. The police arrested 49 of the workers, who were taken to the island's jail. There, two of them were bayoneted to death by a Nauruan constable who alleged they were trying to escape. Uh, 
Yeah. Apparently, yeah, this is trying incident, to escape. Yeah, also tried. known as insulting his mother. Yeah, exactly. Or I didn't like the way he looked at me. Who yeah. Knows? He, he, if he was trying to escape, he should have talked shit. Huh. Uh, he the, said my Lego game was subpar. That motherfucker deserved to die. The government of the Soviet Union and China actually made official complaints against Australia at the United Nations over this incident. Yeah. To which they said, the pants with China and Soviet who? Union are like making complaint. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, United Nations is like, what? Where? Yeah. I actually found a uh, news article about that uh, whole situation if you would like to uh, hear it. Uh, sure. All right. Lay it on me. Nauru riots clash with Chinese workers. Great official secrecy has been maintained by Canberra regarding rather serious riots in June on the phosphate island of Nauru. For the administration of Australia, for which the administration of Australia is responsible, having completed two years' service under indenture, fifteen hundred Chinese laborers employed at Nauru were due for reparation. The steamer Heladon arrived to take them to China. The Chinese refused to go. They built barricades, armed themselves with spears, clubs, and axes, and showered stones upon officials who approached them. The administrator, Mr. M. Ridgway, declared a state of emergency and issued arms to white residents and some native Nauruans. Australian officials fired warning shots over the heads of the Chinese behind the barricades. A clash occurred. Four Chinese were killed. It was announced on July 18th that the state of emergency has passed. But no one yet told what happened to the Chinese. Did they go board the ship, or are they still waving their clubs in Nauru? It is a very great state secret preserved by Mr. Ward as Australian Minister for Territories. So basically, yeah, the article says that, like, hey, they say that the state of emergency passed, but they never actually say what happened to the Chinese people. So there you go. Yeah, so they, hmm. they are not all dead. They all yeah. live just fine. <laughs> As you can see from the makeup of our country, how we uh, all have and now generations later with all these Chinese ignorance we took on, we all have Chinese characteristics. Uh, see? <laughs> they were I all just... slaughtered. <laughs> see, look, they're all still alive here. This bunch of neurons doing like the slant eye thing, be like, we Chinese. <laughs> be all racist. Yeah. Uh and of course, the Australian people not knowing the difference are just like, eh, seems right. Bye. What? So we're up to 1964 now, and the Australian government takes a good, long, hard look at Nauru and says, boy, this rampant strip mining has decimated this once lovely island. This thing will be nigh uninhabitable by the 90s. We should do something. So their plan was not to stop mining, but to offer the Nauru people a new home, one that wasn't ravaged by phosphate mines. The Australian government said that they, Britain, and New Zealand owe the Islanders that much because of what happened. Actually, and they chose Curtis Island off the coast of Queensland, Australia, which is significantly bigger than Nauru's. Nauru's 8 square miles, 261 square miles for Curtis Island. Australia figured the cost of resettling the Nauruans to Curtis Island was an estimated, it was going to be 10 million pounds at the time, which is uh, 324 million Australian dollars in 2022. So, not really a cheap thing going on, but they were going to set them up with housing, agriculture, fishing industries, build some schools, and basically just be like, hey, we got everything here set up for you to go. Here's a port, this, that. Sort of like a starting civilization city, or sim city. There was one catch, though. The nation of Nauru would be no more. They'd, ha they'd have their island, but they'd be completely under Australian authority. The Nauru people did not like this idea because they did not want to become Australian citizens. They wanted to be their uh, own, you know, separate entity. Maybe they caught an inkling from the Wild West days in America and were like, hey, wait a minute. We've seen other people get offered this kind of stuff and it didn't work out well. Yeah. They, if they were going to be given Curtis Island, they were like, we, we want that as our island. That's going to be our thing. That's going to be the new Nauru. Australia said, uh-uh, we ain't doing that, buddy. So Nauru said, nope. And instead, they're like, give us back our island, I." Right? And Australia actually agreed to this, and they started doing the paperwork towards an independent Nauru. And that's going to do it for part one on our series about Nauru. Stay tuned next week for our conclusion when we take a look at how Nauru handles its sudden independence and what it decides to do with the ecological disaster that is the phosphate mine. We'll then talk about how those decisions have affected modern-day Nauru on the next episode of Off to Off Topic. This is where the ending jingle goes. This is where the ending jingle goes. I don't know if we need one. I don't know if we'll get one. But if we do, then here is where it goes.